thank you very much. It is a pleasure uh, to be here at the NASDAQ um, and talking about uh, opportunities in Cuba. I have the great privilege of sharing the stage right now with Roberta Jacobson. Roberta, Roberta was sworn in as the Assistant Secretary of State for Hemispheric Affairs in 2012. Previously, she was the Acting Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs, as well as the Principal Assistant Secretary for Western Hemispheric Affairs. And from 2007 to 2011, she was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Canada, Mexico, and NAFTA. Um, and she has had an incredibly distinguished career. And I'm also really proud to be sharing the stage with an Assistant Secretary of State for Hemispheric Affairs that's a woman. So this is um, really exciting as well. Um, we're going to go right into having a conversation and a dialogue. I just want to say that it, we started working, as I said earlier, with Cuba and our Cuba project in 2007. But I never really thought that we would be on a stage sharing the stage with the US government talking about uh, an opening, a historic moment in time between the United States um, and Cuba. So, Roberta, you were the first U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemis Hemispheric Affairs to visit Cuba in 38 years. What was your first impression? Um, well, thank you, Susan. I, I really am thrilled to be here, thrilled to be with all of you. Um, and uh, I have to say that that trip was remarkable for me. Uh, it wasn't my first time in Cuba, but it was certainly my first time as the Assistant Secretary and, and the first time since the December 17th announcement by the President. And um, there were a lot of people who had said before I went, you know, this is really historic. Um, paraphrasing the Vice President, this is a big blank deal. Um, uh, but the thing that really impressed me the most uh, on both sides of the Florida Straits were the individual people, um, not policymakers, not uh, necessarily people you would know, uh, who came up to me and took my hand or asked if they could have a picture with me and said, we are so excited. We are so hopeful. We think this is so great because we have hopes for our families, for our children, for the future. Um, and th that had an enormous impression on me. Um, these were Cubans, Cuban-Americans, uh, people who really thought it was long overdue and who felt like there was going to be a sort of a new uh, spirit in the relationship and in their own lives. And that, in some ways, was both very inspiring for me and kind of reminded me as a policymaker uh, that it isn't really just about the, the policy and the politics, it's about human beings. Um, but it also made me feel, in, very, in many ways, the burden of it, much more than someone saying it's a big blank deal, right? Because it is about people. Um, but also things had changed in Cuba since I had been there even four years before. Um, and part of that was the president's announcement, part of it was increased remittances, um, so there were, there were changes going on even, even in the couple of years since I had been there. Did you get a chance to walk around the streets and kind not, of... Not, <laughs> not so much, although you've all seen the one brief time I got to walk around the streets. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> um, there, there wasn't a whole lot of time to walk around the streets. We were, we were having those talks fairly intensively and, and it, was, it, it was intended as a conversation in that first trip uh, quite intensively about uh, the president's policy and what we could do to, uh, to begin the diplomatic relationship, how we might begin to implement that policy. But there was a, a moment when I was um, going to visit uh, Cardinal Ortega in Old Havana. And so the streets are very narrow in that part of Old Havana and I was going to walk from, from one area to another. And uh, this was not on any public record so I thought it was a really good opportunity for me to get a little bit of a walk. Um, and I came around a corner uh, to go towards the Cardinal's office and there was a camera crew <laughs> that was in my face and I'm not used to that the way some people are. 
Um, and they followed me, a still photographer and a camera crew, for about a block and a half. And we asked whether they hadn't gotten enough at that point, and couldn't they just let us walk the rest of the two blocks in peace? But they didn't. So I think some people have seen that footage. But um, that was the only walking I did. It was about, about a three or four block stretch. Um, so I, I didn't get to see as much as I would like. So you worked from the minute the president decided that he really wanted to change the policy. Can you give us a little bit of flavor as you moved into that? And in your feeling, how has the president really changed our posture towards Cuba? Well, I think the president's policy and his intention is that through the direct diplomatic engagement, um, we can change the way that we engage uh, both with the Cuban government, obviously, where we've not had that direct diplomatic engagement, um, and support the Cuban people. Um, it has been our policy to support the Cuban people for quite a while. Uh, it's certainly been the president's policy to support the Cuban people since 2009 when he came to office, but it hasn't been particularly effective. Um, and if we want to try and support the Cuban people, we have to figure out a more effective way to do that. Economically, whether it's Cuenta Propistas, whether it's the emerging private sector, or whether it is artists, cultural figures, um, or whether it's human rights activists, emerging independent media voices, bloggers, journalists. And so what we were trying to figure out is what is the best way for us to engage with the Cuban people and with the Cuban government uh, and the president believes strongly that the best way to do that is directly. Um, and so we began this process of normalization, but it's very important to understand that the reestablishment of diplomatic relations is only one very small part of normalization, which is a much longer process that will take years. The part we're working on right now is the diplomatic part of reestablishing diplomatic relations, which is a first step on a much longer road. Um, but, but he believes, as he's shown, I think, around the world, that you have to engage even with people you don't agree with if you're going to get to a point where you can hopefully bring about change, but also understand what's going on in those places in order to help the people, in order to help the citizens of that country. So. We have no illusions about the nature of the Cuban regime. We've made that really clear. We have no illusions about the ability through dialogue for that government to change overnight. We're not saying that through that dialogue we think it's going to change from night to day. But we do think that we can more effectively support the Cuban people economically through private entrepreneurs, through small businesses that are now authorized in over 200 categories of professions, and that we can help bring information to the Cuban people, which is critical both for their economic livelihoods and for ultimately uh, political um, self-determination. So you've had three meetings, two in yeah. Cuba, I guess, and one in Washington. Right. And what's been accomplished, and, and what's the next step? Well, I think, you know, um, we've had two formal rounds. We've had one that was a, a smaller group when I went to Cuba the most recent time. Um, and because we're still in this first stage, which is the opening of embassies and the establishment of diplomatic relations, I know that it may not look like we've accomplished very much, but I have to tell you, after 50 plus years of a great deal of distrust and, and a lack of confidence, we have made a great deal of progress. Um, obviously, the biggest outward sign of that progress will be opening of embassies, and I'm confident we will get there, and that will be a very visible sign of movement. Um, in fact, you won't see much movement uh, externally until we get there. Um, and so I, I'm not going to be able to say, you know, we've done this and that and the other thing on the checklist towards embassies until we open embassies. Um, but we are making progress on that. On the other hand, the, the other part of what we talked about in our first uh, conversation in Havana was a series of bilateral dialogues that we wanted to undertake 
to expand the relationship on issues that we believe are very much in our national interest, and we believe Cuba uh, also is in their national interest. Some of these are issues on which we already have dialogues and we wanted to broaden them or deepen them, counter-narcotics, migration, um, scientific cooperation, global health issues such as Ebola, um, issues such as environmental cooperation such as oil spill mitigation in the Gulf of Mexico. But there are also new areas where we have proposed and dialogues have been accepted. Civil aviation, uh, human rights, which have just gotten underway in a conversation this week which really was about, they were talks about talks. They were on methodology and form. We haven't yet had the substantive conversations, and as you can imagine, those will probably be the hardest ones. Um, but also conversations on things like trafficking in persons, um, law enforcement cooperation, such as fugitives and other areas that we have been discussing but need to broaden our cooperation. So there are a whole range of issues on which we have dialogues that are either ongoing or that we are starting, civil aviation, trafficking in persons, telecommunications and information technology, um, marine life and resources, and uh, I think at least one other have begun since the December 17th announcement. So I think that shows momentum in many areas. Um, that we want to continue. I think what's really interesting is that there were some dialogues and things accomplished even before the December right. 17th announcement. So this is just some of these initiatives are just adding building to on that building on those initiatives. You know, it's really a really important. good point, Susan, because one of the things people don't realize is that under the Obama administration, there's been a fairly pragmatic approach towards Cuba from the beginning, right? And you've seen it in the successive regulatory changes that got us ready for this point, right, in terms of um, making sure that we were encouraging increases in remittances and travel for Cuban Americans, but also um, for purposeful travel in the 12 categories of authorized travel to Cuba. But also, we felt really strongly that for areas of cooperation that are in our interests, we need to do them, right? Having dialogues on migration, on oil spill mitigation, uh, and environmental cooperation, on counter-narcotics, those are in our interests. It is foolish in the extreme to say we're not going to talk to uh, a, a government like Cuba on those issues when it's in our interest to do so. So those, some of those issues were already being discussed before the December 17th announcement. But, but this really gives us an opportunity to do a great deal more. Absolutely, and to really enhance everything right. that we're doing and build yeah. trust, which I think and is the most important that, issue to and that, really make progress. And that's going to take some time, honestly. So moving on, Cuba's still on the state-sponsored terrorist list. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the timeline and the possibility to remove them? Because that's a major impediment, um, I think, for the private sector to more fully engage. Well, I think that um, I need to be clear about, about something that um, we're in the process of the review. As you, as you all saw, on December 17th, the President announced that he had asked the Secretary of State to undertake the review uh, of their placement on the list, which was done in 1982. Um, I really need to be clear about the fact that there's been no determination. Um, there's been, the review is undertaken by the State Department and we're in the middle of that review. So there's been no conclusion yet. Mm -hmm. um, we can't prejudge the outcome. And I know that many people have written and discussed this um, and believe they've come to a conclusion about this already. Um, but that isn't over till it's over. And it won't be announced one way or another until it's announced by the president. Not the secretary, he makes a recommendation to the president. It's the president's decision. So we need to be really clear about that, that it is not prejudged. It's a review that begins with the intelligence and then any other source material and then takes its course. But I think it's, it's in very advanced stages um, and we'll try and get that done as quickly as possible. As I said at the beginning of this process, and I'll reiterate it, um, we're, we're good students. Um, the president asked for it to be done within six months. We're about three months into that process. Uh, we certainly expect to hand our work into the professor well ahead of the deadline.
And I think that's quite important, for example, for the IDB and other entities to really get in there and help Cuba create a regulatory environment that's conducive to foreign direct investment as well, I would guess, no? Well, I think, I mean, I, you know, I know that um, depending on how the conclusion of the review comes out, um, there are various layers of sanctions right. uh, on Cuba. Um, one of those is the state sponsor of terrorism issue. Um, if the review results in the removal of Cuba from that list, that would be one of the issues that has been problematic. Um, I do think that there are other issues that have been problematic in uh, the issue of whether it's the IDB or, or other international institutions. Um, but it's clear that technical assistance of the sort that various institutions do, including the IDB, to move Cuba towards a market economy is going to be critical in the future. Absolutely. Um, so the next and the final step to really regularizing relations with Cuba would be lifting the embargo. And I remember that I think the president mentioned that in the State of the Union address uh, last January. So could you comment on, on how you see that and how that might move forward? Well, the good news about that is, you know, um, Under Secretary Selig punted a bunch of things to me, and now I get the great pleasure of punting that to Congress, right? Um, that is obviously a congressional function. The embargo is, is, uh, has been uh, uh, implemented by legislation ultimately, although having begun as executive order. Um, but, um, but the president did make clear in, in the State of the Union, he obviously began on December 17th talking about how he thought it was, it, was, it was time for a debate on this subject. He went a bit further in the State of the Union talking about thinking that it was time for movement on this issue and the lifting of the embargo. What we've seen since then, I think, is a great deal of activity, in particular in the Senate. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there are now three bills that have been introduced um, on aspects of the embargo, beginning with travel. Um, there is um, a fairly robust bipartisan group that is uh, supportive of taking action, um, led by some like Senator Flake, Senator Durbin, and others who've been outspoken in this regard. Um, and so I think there's a great deal of, inf of interest in looking at these issues. I think, you know, I, I testified on Capitol Hill a couple of weeks ago, and I think one of the things that Senator Rubio said at the end of the hearing on the Senate side was that he could not recall a time when there had been such a, a debate on the subject. There were, I think, seven members who were present for that hearing. Um, on the Senate side in the subcommittee. Um, and it was a very lively debate. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really, I think, very good. I'm not sure we had had such a debate before with, with members of the committee who had not been engaged on this issue before, fully engaged. Um, I think that's a very good thing. I think the President thinks that's a very good thing, that, that the issue is being joined and being debated. So that, that's what we would like to see. Um, and we're hopeful that that will be continuing, um, but I wouldn't necessarily put money on a time frame for that. Well, I guess one of the things that Congress will be very interested in is human rights, and you mentioned human rights um, in one of your previous uh, answers. Right. And yeah, it's how do you see, what are the really big issues outstanding and from your perspective? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's not a surprise to anybody that in the conversations we've had with, um, with our Cuban counterparts, we have different conceptions of, of human rights and our international obligations. Um, you know, there are still far too many short-term detentions that are taking place. Those numbers were up consistently over the last few years and remain very high. Um, Cuba is moving towards elections. Um, they are in the process of electoral reform at this point, but we see no indication of opening towards multi-party uh, uh, openness, a, a, a willingness to allow multi-party democracy. Um, people are still not able to have freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. Um, 
Those are obviously things that we would like to see. Cuba continues to believe that that is interference on our part. We believe those are universal rights as enshrined in United Nations documents to which um, all of us are uh, adherents. So we, we still have differences. We simply think that a more effective way of pursuing what are ultimately, you know, we believe universal goals is engagement and support for the Cuban people. Cuba sees issues in the United States as violations of human rights. They've made that very clear. They've been critical of um, issues in the United States. Our response to that has never been defensive, quite the contrary. Um, we have always been, in this country, the first to acknowledge our own shortcomings and the first to acknowledge that Americans have the right to speak out about those shortcomings and to pursue remedies which is what's so great about our system. Um, but I think that's a conversation that will continue. And I think, for me anyway, and I'm not leading the human rights dialogue, my colleague Tom Malinowski, who really is a true expert on human rights and the right person to, to lead it, I think we welcome the opportunity to actually join the issue, to have the conversation, again, without any illusions that that is going to immediately change the situation. But what we want to do when we have an embassy and when we are able to travel more freely in Cuba and talk to more Cubans is talk to as many Cubans as possible of all stripes, right? When we are in Havana, unable to get outside Havana and talk to all kinds of Cubans, um, it, it limits our perspective on the Cuban people and that, you know, we talk about supporting the Cuban people, but we want to do that in the broadest. I, I promised my counterpart at one point um, that I would commit that our diplomats would try and talk to as many of the 11 million Cubans as we could. Um, we, we don't really have a bias. We want to talk to everybody. Which leads me into the, to the last question before I open it up. Um, the private sector or the emerging private sector. Is there a dialogue about how to support them? I know it's something that we've worked very hard with, so trying to support entrepreneurship right. and focus on entrepreneurs. Is yes. there a space in your dialogues for that as well? You know, we don't have a specific dialogue on supporting the private sector or the cuenta propistas, which I think is a sort of an ironic term since it didn't begin as a compliment. Um, but I think in my mind, the way that we've gotten at that issue with our Cuban counterparts is we've had a good dialogue about the regulations that the president implemented. And we're having further conversations with them about the regulations and how they're being implemented and what they mean and, and how the Cuban government will allow them to be implemented. How far will they go in allowing those regulations to be implemented? And one of the key regulations, obviously, one of the the key reforms in the president's policy is um, the ability of people to export to uh, emerging entrepreneurs uh, and to import products from the emerging private sector. And so I think, you know, from our perspective, facilitating those imports and exports uh, is going to be crucial, right? Um, and so, you know, I found a conversation that I had on my first visit since the policy uh, change in January. I found a conversation I had with about a dozen of those cuenta propistas, one of the most exciting meetings I had, one of the most hopeful and one of the most exciting. They had all clearly made the psychological shift from reliance on the state to reliance on themselves for their economic futures. And I found that very, very exciting. And I think the kind of thing that all of you would find so hopeful and what we're trying to encourage. And if the Cuban state is to reform and there are people who are going to be out of work and are already out of work. This is what has to flourish and it is still much too difficult for those folks to get supplies and inputs reliably and much too difficult for them to reliably produce what they can um, and that's what we're really trying to stimulate. So it, that to me is one of the most important areas 
and, and the remittances, allowing more remittances to flow back to Cuba to support some of these micro businesses is also just critical. Um, this going is forward. critical, and that's why the remittance limit was removed for this. And it's one of the reasons why I think the programs being done by um, organizations like Cuba Emprende, uh, who I think you're going to hear from, um, but I think those programs to train entrepreneurs, because remember that folks are coming to this without any of the framework that all of you have, and you're going to hear from Maria Contreras Sweet about small businesses and what we can do to help, but training entrepreneurs is so crucial. And for me, when business people ask, especially in businesses which cannot yet do business directly in Cuba because the embargo is still in place, um, and they ask what can they do, how can they kind of get ready to engage with Cuba, my answer is get ready through working with private entrepreneurs, with the small and emerging private entrepreneurs by supporting programs like Cuba Emprende and other training programs for these private entrepreneurs. Cuba Emprende has trained a remarkable number of them through whatever mechanism you can to get products and support to the private sector and to help train them. That is going to be your future uh, in Cuba. Well, there's so much more that we could talk about in the private sector, but I do want to leave some time for questions. So why don't we start right here? If you could just say your name or... No, that's okay. Hi, my name is Bayada, and I'm a, I own a small woman-owned business. And I've been going to Cuba since 2003. And one thing that I've noticed, I've been back twice after the president's announcement. And I've noticed uh, a feeling of being overwhelmed, maybe by the Cuban government. So I wanted to see uh, uh, what you could, you know, how that's affected negotiations and how, how we, in fact, uh, can help them uh, through the, uh, and, and make it productive. Yeah, that, that is a great insight. And I guess my answer to that would be, you got it in one. Um, that's exactly the sense that we have had at times is that, look, this is a very big change. Both presidents took a huge step after so many years. And I think we, we were a little overwhelmed too, initially, right? This was a big change for, for us. Um, and, you know, for many kind of bureaucrats sitting at their desks, you know, sort of from one day to the next, <laughs> um, it, was, it was a tough adjustment. We put out the regulations, and I, I say we because state was doing a great deal of work on this, but I have to give my Commerce and Treasury colleagues enormous credit. Those regulations came out on January 16th. That is under a month from when the president made that announcement to when the reg changes came out. Now, come on, say what you will about government. That was light speed. But I really feel, and those are still a work in progress, but I really feel as if the Cuban government has been very much sort of overwhelmed by these changes. And there is, I have seen in my own dealings, many of our agencies have seen, there is a real kind of funnel in terms of who's allowed to make decisions on these new things that narrows to a very small point. And that's a control issue, but it also makes things very slow. So, you know, they're gonna have to decide how much reform, how many decisions they're willing to make because things need to move. Um, we can help, we're offering help. We're offering to move. But those ultimately have to be the Cuban government's decision. But the whole point of this policy, as somebody said earlier, was it is no longer going to be the U.S. government that's holding things back. So, Boris, and then we're going to go to the back of the room. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jacobson, you, you mentioned at the beginning that what most impressed you was, was engaging with people. Uh, um, and uh, you also mentioned the pragmatic um, approach from the administration mm -hmm. and um, opening embassies and, and diplomats engaging with people. But um, can we expect, and I know it's difficult to, to throw a timeline, uh, a real flow, the, the increase of, of both citizens from both nations uh, 
holding coffee shops conversations on, on all levels and, and, and trying to, to smooth all these years of mistrust and preconceptions. That, and, and, and I think people, again, are, 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 it's a, are a very powerful element to smooth all of this and, and take it beyond just the diplomatic engaging yeah. with people, but both citizens from both nations engaging. You know, here, here's my premise. My premise is always that citizens of each country are way ahead of where their governments are. That's always my premise, even being a sort of lifelong government bureaucrat. Um, in fact, I hope they are. Um, I have never found over a 20-year period on and off going to Cuba Honestly, I have never found an enormous hostility in the population towards Americans. Um, and I don't think there's a lot to overcome in terms of the population of Cubans. There certainly isn't a lot to overcome in the population of Americans. And so I think that happens pretty quickly. I think it's already happened. That when Americans go to Cuba under those 12 categories of travel, um, they go and they are welcomed and they have those exchanges already. Um, and I hope that the more Cubans are allowed to travel to the United States as they have begun to under the change in regulations that Cuba implemented a couple of years ago, they too are beginning to see a different United States than they had been told existed for a long time. So. That's crucial, it seems to me, because each of those constituencies helps to move their governments. But, um, but governments have to get past what we've been locked in for a long time. And so that takes a little longer sometimes. Can we move to the, to the back? And let's take two together, right there. Uh, Philippe Pouletti, chairman of Abivax, a French biotech company which has been collaborating with uh, the CIGB in Havana for the last five years. Uh, one comment, we talk a lot about uh, supporting and helping the Cuban people, but in our last five years, we find partners who are very proud and very well educated. And I think often they resent when we talk of helping them. They like very much when we talk about partnership of equal, and in fact, there are areas of great strengths. The biotech, vaccine, healthcare sector is very strong. Uh, that was my first comment, but congratulations for, from France for your political move. And I have a question. Uh, when we ask our US law firms, uh, what is the exact rules of OFAC? US investors can inf invest in a company which has less than 50% of its business with Cuba, they send you 15 pages of legal languages, and the conclusion could is we're not sure. Could you get to the question, because sure. we're really short yeah. in time? So my question is, could you have a hotline uh, to answer easily for companies who say, do we meet the rules or not, uh, so that we're not in okay. uh, uncertain situation? Um, how about a question over, is there, right here, in the center, over here? A question, please. No comments. Just a quick question. Thank you, Under Secretary Jacobson. Uh, my question is, how can the United States work with Cuba in helping uh, organizations that rescue and educate um, victims of trafficking? And we'll take a third question right here. Thank you, Assistant Secretary. Nora Gamas from the Miami Herald. Um, has this annulment uh, of Venezuela been a threat to national security? Is this, uh, has this impacted the negotiation with the Cuban government in any way? Okay, so let you, can we, can we take those? Yeah. Um, on the first one, on the question of a, of a sort of a hotline, let me say that in, in the December 17th changes and the reg changes that were announced in January, we're very much cognizant that those are a work in progress and that those are designed. And let me say that um, the regulations on countries that are sanctioned 99.99% of the time tell the public what they can't do. These are fundamentally regulations which tell people what they can't, what they can do, 
within a sanctions regime which is telling you what you can't do. So they're like carve-outs to do things within a sanctions regime. So they're a little bit odd, right? They're not what our OFAC and Commerce colleagues do normally. And they're works in progress, and we've made really clear that we need feedback from the business community as to, like, we tried to do X, but we found it was impossible because your regs are really not providing for it so that we can clarify them. We really need the feedback because they are not designed to be written in stone. They're unusual in that respect. So we're going to be putting out, we, the Commerce and the Treasury Department, new frequently asked questions um, pretty regularly to try and get at some of the questions. I actually think what you're talking about is a longer standing concern on investment. Um, and I'm happy to take back the issue of a, of a hotline and, and a more sort of streamlined procedure, but, but I think it's not directly connected to the December 17th issue, because I think it's a more long-standing question of investment and the 50% rule. Um, on the issue of trafficking, it's a really good question. You know, Cuba and we have just begun to cooperate on the issue of trafficking in persons, and as you know, we have a congressionally mandated report every year um, to report on how countries are doing on trafficking, on cooperating with the United States and with international organizations on um, reducing trafficking in persons, which frankly is a problem that there's not a country in the world that isn't dealing with it, including the United States. Um, Cuba has taken some, some significant efforts in the last couple of years. They remain on tier three in our parlance. Um, we've begun to have some good cooperation, but as of yet, I don't know of any either international or even local NGOs that work on the issue in Cuba such that others could partner with them. It is an entirely state function, as most things are in Cuba, so it might be difficult to do. Um, the one thing I would say, and I don't know that they're working on it yet, is it would be interesting to inquire the extent to which the church might be interested in working, the Catholic Church or other church groups in providing either shelters or other work with women or children, because that's often a way that you can do partnerships and work in Cuba when there aren't necessarily secular NGOs. So it might be worth looking into whether Caritas, for example, which does excellent work in Cuba, has any work on, on work with women or children uh, in trafficking. Um, on the Venezuela issue, um, I guess what I would say is that um, my, my own view is that I do not think it's had a major impact on our conversations with Cuba. Uh, there's clearly been a fair amount of background noise about uh, the sanctions that were implemented on Venezuela as part of the law um, and, and a certain amount of, uh, I think, uh, disingenuous uh, interpretation of those sanctions, which, by the way, were against seven people, that's all. Um, and Cuba, I think, as was to be expected, supports Venezuela in its rejection of those sec sanctions, but I don't think it's had a major effect on the conversations. So we've been given a pre reprieve and we're allowed to have one more last round of questions. So way, way in the back, right over here, it's the first one. Good morning, Ms. Secretary. Uh, I've been working in the telecommunication business now with Cuba for several years. Could you years. say who you are? Please. Luis Coelho. Thanks. And one of our biggest challenges has been to transfer the money to Cuba. Um, right now, well, for telecommunication, uh, the business is basically prepaid. So it's very hard to do. And uh, back in the 90s, when I started doing the, the business, we were postpaid. Right now, it's very difficult. Is the, is the administration doing anything to ease up the, the way that we can do business with them? Uh, second question will come right over here. Hi, um, I'm Anthony Rubenstein. As an American citizen that's been living in Cuba, married to a, a Cuban wife, can you give us a better perspective on when, not timeline, but when the embassy does begin to function, will it be a fully formed embassy? Are there going to be any limitations on the activities at the embassy? Uh, can I freely walk in there and get usual embassy services, et cetera. Quick question, last question right here. Hi, 
<clears throat> my name is Ernesto Morales. In, since I'm covering this for Telemundo Miami, I'm sorry, but I need to ask my question in Spanish. Um, ante todo, por cierto, soy cubano y vine de Cuba hace solo cuatro años, así que conozco muy bien la realidad que usted estaba contando. Nuestra pregunta es, ¿cómo separar al gobierno cubano de los inversores cubanos cuando obviamente todo está controlado por el gobierno? Vemos muchas personas interesadas en ayudar directamente a los cuentapropistas y a los pequeños empresarios cubanos, pero ¿cómo hacerlo si todo está controlado por el gobierno? Muchas gracias. Roberta. Ok. Good questions. Um, so on the telecommunications question and the, the funds issue, um, this is actually an excellent question and, and it's, a, it's a fundamental one for us because we are obviously with this policy trying very hard to encourage um, opening of telecommunications relationships, um, increasing telecommunications access Um, telecommunications access of the Cuban people, telecommunications access to U.S. businesses, um, enormous, hopefully, potential for information technology in Cuba, which is incredibly empowering. And I really want to stress, not just empowering as citizens who have a right to know things about their government, about their country, about the world, be, be connected. Um, and I actually think the internet connectivity rate that was used a little bit earlier today was high. Um, at 14%, I think it's significantly lower than that, but I also think the internet connectivity rate might be a little bit misleading because people are sort of skipping over internet connectivity directly to handheld, to mobile devices, but, but in any case, being connected via something, right, is really important. I, I actually think mobile devices is going to be the... Place. Right, but, but they have to be connected to right. something, right? Absolutely. You know, when I was in Cuba the last time, a um, bunch of people were taking pictures and they all had you know, Android, Samsung, you know, um, iPhones not connected to anything. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's critical. And I think there are a couple things that get us part of the way there, but we have to keep moving along, right? We can now have banks with correspondent accounts, right? That was a very important first step. We have credit card, um, uh, credit card operations that can be Uh, run in Cuba for any of the 12 categories of travel. Um, we have licensed, obviously, we have agreed to license telecommunications activities so that you can get a license, which means that there are certain rights and privileges that come with that. Um, ultimately, um, as was the case in agriculture, right, there, there may be, as the telecommunications things go forward, there may be... Um, cases that move forward that set precedents, legal precedents, that begin to allow things to move forward, uh, keeping funds safe from judgments or claims, um, and, and carve out uh, an area for movement. But I realize that we have to continue to push this envelope. Second, uh, on the embassy question, an embassy is an embassy and is an embassy. Uh, I want to be really clear about that. That's one of the most important things in our conversations. Um, One of the reasons that things take or are taking a while is we need certain things to run an embassy. Now, some embassies have, you know, I, I can't swear to you that the embassy is going to run exactly the way our embassy in London runs, but it's going to run as close to the way our embassy in Moscow or in China runs as it can, right? We don't, we don't give certain privileges up. I, I want to be clear also that we have either the largest or one of the largest diplomatic missions in Cuba right now, complete with American citizen services and visa operations. There are 360 people who work in our interest section in Cuba right now. Of that, there are about 60 Americans. The rest are local. So we give a lot of services to Americans right now. But one of the things that has been difficult is making sure that there's real access for people, especially Americans who need services, that it doesn't seem hard to get into. I want that to be available to Cubans and Americans equally without fear or a little bit of, um, you know, maybe more security than is needed, let's say. So, um, yes, we will have a fully functioning embassy as elsewhere, and Americans and Cubans will get all of the services that we provide elsewhere. Uh, last one, bueno, este, 
en, 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 en el tema de, de cómo podemos proveer para las cuentas propistas cosas que necesitan para tener sus empresas, eh, los emprendedores. Sabemos nosotros que para hacerlo en Cuba es necesario, porque eso es el sistema ahora, es necesario pasar por la institución de gobierno, de gobierno cubano al import eh, para bueno, destinar las cosas a las cuentas propicias, al a la, la, el sector privado que existe ahora. Así que es permitido este, pasar esta este, bueno, mercancía ¿no? por al import, pero es esencial que el usuario al final de ese proceso confirmado es una persona que es cuenta propista, es una persona que es emprendedor eh, privado utilizando las, este, las cosas eh, que, que una persona de los Estados Unidos está mandando de los Estados Unidos utilizando en su empresa privada en Cuba, al final. Eso es. Así que sabemos que eso tiene por necesidad pasar por el sistema gober gubernamental por ahora en Cuba. Porque si no permitimos eso, eso nos sirve para llegar al final a la cuenta propista que necesita esas, esas cosas, ¿no? Pero vamos a ver si eso puede cambiar y podemos este, mandar las cosas directamente a la gente al, al otro lado, ¿ya? Bueno, muchísimas gracias. So, with Thank that, you. sadly, we have to end our discussion. Um, we've already been given liberty of 10 I'm extra <laughs> minutes. Um, but I want to thank um, Roberta, not just for being Secretary Jacobson, not just for being with us today, but for everything that she's done to facilitate this change in policy. Because it's the president that decides, but then there are leaders that make things happen. And the secretary, the assistant secretary, is one of those people that really has made this happen. And so I want to give her a great thanks for both being here and for that. <laughs>